On the Road. Welcome to On the Road to COP26, um, everyone. This panel is about, is biodiversity feeling the heat? Um, where it's co-organized by the scientific department of the Embassy of France in the UK and Imperial College London um, ahead of the COP26. So the aims of today are to showcase the latest biodiversity research from leading researchers at the Natural History Museum in Paris, CNRS and Imperial College London. Again, preparing for COP26. And, and really what we want to do is to challenge all of us to think about how we can work together to have a positive impact on biodiversity. So my name is Morena Mills. I'm a reader in environmental policy and practice at Imperial College London. And my research focuses on applied biodiversity conservation. Um, I'm interested in improving policy that impacts the persistence of species and is good for people. So it improves people's well-being. Um, I'm really excited to be moderating this event. Um, and before I introduce the, spe the speakers, I'm just gonna make a few points. So this is a public event and it's being recorded. We have four 10 minute presentations and then we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentations. So if you can please post your questions in the Q&A section and you can like questions so then we know what questions we should prioritize um, from the audience. Uh, you can post your questions anonymously or using your name, it's really up to you. So I'm now pleased to introduce our four speakers. The first speaker is Dr. Bruno Davy, and he's the president of the French Museum of Natural History. He's a paleontologist and marine biologist, and his research has led him to explore the evolution of biodiversity. He's a prolific communicator and author. We also have Dr. Hélène Morlon, and she is uh, the CNRS research director at the Institute of Biology of the École Normale Supérieure. Pardon my French. Um, I'm not very good at a French accent. Um, she's got a background in mathematics and ecology. Um, from Imperial College London, then we have Dr. Christina banks -Leici. Um, She's a senior lecturer at the Department of Life Sciences um, at Imperial College London. And Chris works at the interface of community ecology and landscape ecology. And her main goal is to unveil the causes and consequences of species turnover and species extinction in human modified landscapes. And she's had some really cool impacts and policy in Brazil. Um, we also have Dr. Richard Gill, and he's a sen senior lecturer at the Department of Life Sciences, the same department as Chris is from, and he studies um, animal responses to environmental stressors to address ecologically applied issues. Um, really, really, really interesting um, research as well with really great uh, ecological uh, and, and political and, and policy impacts. So, um, I'll, I'll pass you on now to Dr. Bruno Davi, and, and first we'll have these four, four um, presentations and then, then we'll, we'll, we'll go into questions. So, so please get your, your fingers ready and start typing some questions through the presentations. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for this introduction. I will try to share my screen. Uh, do you have something? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. It's fine. So thank you. So I will uh, speak to you about the dawn of the sixth extinction and uh, telling you that biodiversity matters. Indeed, biodiversity is crucial for the future of the planet as well as for the equilibrium and sustainability of our society. We are very aware that... Uh, sorry for that techniques. We are very aware that we are a species among millions of our species, and uh, that we are nothing outside the rest of the biosphere. And this was the starting point of the IUCN meeting in Marseille. Regarding this meeting in Marseille, I would like to quickly present different personal feelings as well as more general outputs regarding this, uh, this mondial, this worldwide Congress. I will start by general things. Uh, the IUC in the Congress was not a disconnected event. It was deeply rooted in research results to build knowledge. Uh, one central aim was to assess the state of biodiversity, relying on researchers, inventories, long-term observations, and quite often involving citizen sciences. Another point is that the Congress was a big drum to be here from very far away, all around the earth. Dissemination of results toward the large public is important, 
people have just to know what is going on. In other words, the Congress was a time to explain science and biodiversity to politicians and media. On those basic knowledge and let people know, it becomes possible to build up political trajectories, to set landmarks for the future and become involved. This was quite well done with the vote of many motions regarding grid apes, protection of deep sea, of deep sea ocean ecosystems, application of a precautionary principle regarding applications of synthetic biology and their impact on biological systems. An important formal conclusion of the meeting was the Marseille Manifesto. And the Marseille Manifesto tell us that our response to climate and biodiversity emergencies must be mutually reinforcing. For example, measures designed to address climate change must not lead to further biodiversity loss. IUCN members and partners commit to deliver on the following actions as a substantive and significant contribution to the post-pandemic recovery and the biodiversity climate crisis. From that follows a list of various commitments. Among others, the Greece committed to reduce overfishing by establishing no tech zones in 10% of their territorial waters by 2030. Uh, there is a promotion of a treaty on plastic pollutions over uh, 30 subnational government cities, partner organization, and IUCN agreed to expand universal access to high quality green spaces, and so on, and so on. From that, some personal comments now. I have had the feeling that several politicians just discovered that biodiversity and climate are related that biodiversity and climate interact one on the other and are not two antagonistic aspects of the environmental question. This was quite strange because they should have listened at scientific results for several decades. Uh, for the rest, and let me show that one, for example, which is a scientific result about the interaction between uh, climate and biodiversity. It was done in, in France. Uh, using citizen science, you can, oh, you can see that the temperature is increased and that this push butterflies and birds to move northward, butterflies moving much faster than birds, for example. This is a result, and this is a relatively old result from 2012, and the politicians are just now discovering that, that two, those two phenomena are interrelated, which was a bit strange for me. For the rest, I have the hope that the landmark set in Marseille, say, will be reaffirmed in China next year, and that they will be respected, which is more important. Indeed, the Congress alone, alone cannot do more than encouraging governments, civil society, and private companies to go ahead, to go ahead in the way biodiversity is protected. Now I would like some personal comments regarding arguments and maybe about some lines of action. Uh, the first one is about the depletion of biodiversity. Depletion of biodiversity corresponds to the cost of inaction. It's not nothing, it is not nothing. As many studies have demonstrated and quantified the monetary value of biodiversity. Few examples. Oh. Few examples. A single whale represents 1.8 million euros by sequestration of carbon. The, the reintroduction of sea otters in Vancouver Island represents about 4.3 million Canadian dollars per year, without counting the tourism, which represents much more. Regarding the insects, the well known insects. Uh, many in services related to insects have been evaluated in the United States, and this represents $57 billion every year just in the United States. So this is really a, a lot. Another aspect that should be promoted is bioinspiration. Bioaspiration is another source of economic value. Life evolves for 3.8 billion years and has produced incredible adaptation. 
we have to look at this and to go ahead towards more elaborated, elaborated solutions inspired by nature. We are at the very beginning in this track and progress could be huge. Progress can be about aerodynamism, adhesion, hydrophobic, climate mitigation, limitation of risk regarding big fires, limitation of flooding. You have the example of beavers in, in UK, remediation of soils by plants, agroecology, and even biodesign and art are sometimes inspired, very often inspired by biodiversity. From that, how to go ahead? In universities, we have to develop research and teaching in a more transversal way to overpass disciplinary boundaries. The role of museums is to explain to a large public what is going on. For that, they have to face several challenges, a cultural challenge, a numerical challenge, and a challenge against or with the social networks. Museums can also rely on their huge collections to promote bio-inspired solution. On the side of the companies, of the private companies, those private companies have to promote operational solutions and they have to change their behavior. At the level of states or even above, for example, the European Union, states must develop politics helping to develop and use bio-inspired solution among many other tasks. And the COP15 has just to tell that. To be positive, to end and to be positive, red list and green list exist. They have been set in Marseille and they are real, they are a real and a reliable tool to see what's happened. For example, four among the seven tunia species have recovered due to the reduction in the fishing quotas. This means that politics can really help. This must encourage us to do things at, the, at all levels, from the citizen to the companies to the state. This is relatively important to, to do that. The red list and the green list are working together. The green list are something new because we were just focusing on the bad, bad news, but it's also important to focus on good news. This also underpins the resilience of biodiversity. If we are smart enough, we can live on Earth rather comfortably. If we act, biodiversity can help us and positive things will happen. In addition to that, very last slide, I think that citizen sciences each are very important because we ask to citizen to participate and to be involved. And this is really a very nice tool to teach science, to teach biodiversity and to make people involved in the way they live on Earth, on Earth and in the way we can improve the situation, which is not that good so far. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bruno. That was super, super interesting. Um, I'll, I'll leave the questions to the end of the session. And now, um, if we could move on to Dr. Helene Morlon. Thank you, Bruno. Hello. Um, right now, it says I cannot, okay, we're good. Um, I cannot start the video because the animator stopped it. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Now I'm back. Okay. Yeah, you're perfect. It's perfect. We can see it. Okay, so I will um, share my screen. Does this look good? Are we all set? Yeah, all set. Okay, can go. Um, hello, um, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to be talking about evaluating the effect of past environmental changes on biodiversity, uh, which is a line of research that we're conducting my group. And um, so to start with, so the, the COP is concerned with mitigating uh, the human driven global warming that the Earth is experiencing and the impacts of this global warming on biodiversity, um, human well-being and economics. 
Um, so there's going to be um, a lot of um, seeing these curves of projected climate change in the years to come uh, in the next 10, 100 or 200 years, which are uh, derived from uh, climatic models and which are um, uh, super con concerning, as we know, as Bruno um, uh, emphasized, um, that from what happened in the past, that the evolution of biodiversity um, has been influenced a lot by, by past um, uh, climatic uh, changes. Um, and indeed, um, over the millions of years of um, uh, evolution of biodiversity on Earth, um, uh, uh, biodiversity has already experienced multiple episodes um, of warming and cooling events, uh, which have shaped biodiversity as we see today. Uh, on the right of the bottom curve, uh, we um, uh, see um, uh, the, 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 the current levels of temperature and these projections that are shown um, on, on the top. And so what uh, in, in the in year 2100, and so what is uh, super striking that we can see immedi immediately is um, how uh, fast these changes happen uh, in the context of um, the, the, the speed at which they happened in the past. So that's something to, to keep in mind um, as uh, while I'm going to be talking about uh, investigating the effects of the effect of past environmental changes on uh, biodiversity to keep in mind that the changes that we experience today are um, much faster. So um, uh, comparisons need to be take, taken with caution, of course. But so um, uh, first, like this uh, historical perspective on how uh, climates have changed in the past can give uh, yeah, some perspective to the, to the current changes. So one of the um, uh, lines of research that we um, Carry in my group is driven by this um, overarching question: How did biodiversity respond to the heat in the past? Right. So I'm paraphrasing a little bit the uh, the, the, web, the title of the webinar here, but really, uh, in other words, how did uh, the past climatic variations that the Earth experienced influence the evolution of biodiversity? And when I talk about the evolution of biodiversity, I mean the diversification of species. So we're talking about the um, speciation and extinctions of species that modulate how species richness fluctuates through time. Um, and I'm also talking about the diversification of our phenotypes, so their size, their traits, uh, that also influence ecosystem functioning and relate uh, to also something uh, that we talked about, about um, how um, by the, the effect that biodiversity has on some services that have um, some um, high values. Um, so uh, this question uh, can be analyzed directly uh, using fossil data, which of course is uh, one of the biggest source of information that we can have on how biodiversity um, um, has evolved. Uh, but it has also some shortcomings due to well-known um, uh, problem in incompleteness of a fossil record, partial preservation of species phenotypes in fossil remains, and the, the, the lack of molecular or genetic information for the species. Um, so the approach we um, develop um, in my group is a, a little bit um, different. Uh, the idea is to combine um, modeling uh, with pr present day biodiversity data, so the data that we can collect on species that we observe today, uh, their phenotypes, their genomes, um, and so on, and data on past environmental conditions uh, to detect associations between past environmental changes uh, and um, uh, rates of speciation, extinction, and trait evolution. So I don't have time um, uh, today to go too much in the, in the details of how the modeling work, but uh, the, uh, the basic underlying idea is to use uh, probabilis probabilistic models that represent events of uh, speciation and extinction unfolding through time under various processes, under various scenarios of how biodiversity evolves um, and traits evolving as different versions of different processes on a, uh, on a phylogenetic tree and to develop statistical and computational approaches that allow us to adjust these models to observe data. Uh, in other words, we, um, by do doing this, we can find the models and parameters that best mimic the observed data. And for example, what this allows us to do if we use models where we include a dependency of past speciation and extinction rates or rates of trait evolution to past a temperature, it, this allows us um, to test uh, if and how climatic variations impacted rates um, of um, uh, evolutions, rates of speciation, extinction, phenotypic evolution, and in which direction. 
for example, we can ask the question, uh, was diversification faster under warm uh, or uh, during uh, cold uh, geological periods or um, uh, that type um, of questions. So I'm just going to uh, give um, some examples of the uh, type of results of the main results we, uh, we can obtain with this kind of, uh, of approach. Um, so for example, we found that uh, rates of body size evolution are consistently faster during cold rather than warm geological periods across large uh, species groups such as, such as birds and mammals. Um, we found that uh, speciation rates tend to be uh, faster and warm, under warm geological periods across um, uh, vertebrates. Um, and of course, um, temperature is not uh, uh, the, the only um, environmental variable that changed during Earth history, and it's definitely also not the only thing that um, is changing um, and uh, that is changing at a much faster, uh, faster pace uh, with uh, global warming and that impact the evolution of biodiversity. So sea level have changed, CO2 levels in the atmosphere have changed, pH in the oceans, all the uh, uh, things that uh, we are concerned um, with now. Um, and also the biotic environment experienced by a given clade, um, you know, the, the environment made, made by all the resource competitor or predator species that interact with a given clade. Um, and so changes in all this um, uh, abiotic and biotic environment um, also impacts the evolution of biodiversity. And what we found is that uh, when we apply these types of models to a variety um, of clades and accounting for different environmental drivers, uh, there's not one uh, major environmental change, let's say temperature, that um, uh, all species group responds the most strongly to, uh, but instead uh, the, the change or the, the environmental change that a species group responds to the most strongly um, depends on the species group that we consider and even the direction of the effect, whether uh, there is an increase or a decrease in diversification uh, with a given environmental, environmental variable can um, uh, depend on the group that we consider. Um, of course, there are a lot of uh, questions related to the type of insights that we can gain from studying um, the response of biodiversity to environmental changes in the past in the context of current changes. There are a lot of uh, limitations in extrapolating for what we can see in the past to um, what might happen um, uh, in, um, in, in the context of current uh, changes. Uh, but definitively, uh, the past is one of the main avenues where we can test hypotheses on how um, biodiversity has responded to um, environmental changes. And it's the only um, uh, global scale experiment that we have uh, is um, uh, the past. Um, with that, I um, will um, just end with um, um, thanks for my books and thank you for listening and inviting me. Thank you so much, Helen. That was so, so interesting. Um, next, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Christine, Christina banks Lady to speak. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's see how this will work. Um, hopefully you can see my slide. Oh, no, not yet. Not Hope yet. you can see my slide. Yes, it's perfect. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so uh, for the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I, I wanted to talk about three main topics. So I wanted to build on, on what Bruno was talking about, how there's a biodiversity crisis and this crisis affects us really deeply and how this biodiversity crisis can be mitigated um, through reduction of deforestation and investing in habitat restoration. But when I mean habitat restoration, I don't mean planting trees. It means really restoring the habitat as close as possible to its original version. So... Um, is this changing? It has changed. Um, so back in in early two thousands, um, I was doing my when I was doing my masters in tropical ecology. I used to fly from from São Paulo, the city where my parents lived, to Manaus, which is a city right in the middle of the Amazon with about two million people. And um, and the flight takes about four hours. And I remember very clearly how those two of those hours were flying over continuous, pristine, untouched forest. And now, if you do roughly the same the same journey, you're gonna be flying over a lot more degraded and transformed land. And because the the numbers of species in the Amazon is so large, and and because so many of those species live in a very small area, which means that if you the forest that area you lose the entire species we know that deforestation in the amazon is is one of the greatest causes for biodiversity 
law, so in, in the biodiversity crisis. But it's all too easy to think of bio, uh, this biodiversity crisis being far from us, um, caused by other people and affecting other people. But the same thing is happening here in Europe. So um, insect populations are going down at a rate of 1% per year, but bird populations are also going down pretty dramatically and uh, the populations of many other species. And whether it like it or not, this has quite a, a big impact on, on our lives. So for instance, it has been estimated that 87 of the leading crops um, that we eat are pollinated by animals, and, and these are mostly insects. So the economic impact of this loss in pollination is in the billions of dollars. And, and the loss of birds um, is, is a little bit more removed, but it can also trigger what's called a trophic cascade, which is when the, the loss of a predator leads to the increase in prey. So, and these prey are usually herbivores, and and herbivores eat plants, right? So that leads to an increase in herbivory and leads to plant damage. And again, this costs our pockets about several billion dollars per year as well. So this is all a bit doomy, but what can, can we do about this? Well, actually there's a lot that can be done. And, um, and, and in fact, solving the biodiversity crisis really only requires political will. So first and foremost, foremost I, I really, and I really can't stress this enough, um, we have to stop deforestation in tropical regions. And frankly, any area of old growth. Um, so myself and others uh, have already produced substantial scientific evidence to prove that old growth forests are absolutely irreplaceable. You cannot you know, simply produce another new forest and say it's going to be the same because it is not and um and some of you may think may be thinking well this is not very realistic so let me go back to my example of the amazon forest so you know back in in the early 2000s brazil was seeing some of the highest deforestation um rates of deforestation so you can see in this graph here um where you can have the you have the rates in square kilometers which is quite a large number going all the way to 30,000 square kilometers per year and you can see on the x-axis um the years and you can see that you know, the rates were, were pretty high up until about uh 2005 2006 and then it started declining pretty 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 steeply and um and this was down to really um slow and steady uh, environmental uh, changes in environmental governance that um basically led to you know this this decrease and and brazil was actually heading towards deforestation zero by 2050 that's not a small a small goal by any means and um but brazil had that goal and it was moving towards that direction and and these these changes didn't occur overnight um they required many different forms of actions but brazil was kind of getting there obviously things change now and as you all know and i i'll refrain from commenting on, on this but um um what i what i want to pass the message is that that is possible to change it now, what about Europe? Well, the thing here is a little bit more complicated. And some of our previous results, for instance, have shown that due to this long history of disturbance here in Europe, and actually uh, much, much of the Northern Hemisphere, species are less dependent on one primary habitat as tropical species, which means that they can you know, occur in a forest and in a grassland. And while you know, it's still crucial that we protect the, the last remaining areas of old growth, such as Bielorussia forest, for instance, the best strategy in Europe is often to increase the heterogeneity of habitats. So instead of one big wheat field, what we need is um, areas of forest and grassland and cropland all together, because this will um, maximize the, the species, the number of species that you can get in that area. Um, so Europe is also investing heavily in reforestation and tree planting. And in fact, some of the large, largest increases in forested area is here in Europe and, and in China. And the UK as well is pushing this agenda of tree planting. Um, and, and that's partly a, a carbon sequestration strategy, but also to tackle to some, some level of biodiversity loss. But here's, here's the issue though. Um, tree, well, 
So tree planting can make some level of contribution to carbon sequestration. It's not gigantic, uh, but it, it does contribute. Um, but it cannot, and in a, again, it's important to stress this, it does not mitigate biodiversity loss. This is because there's a huge difference between tree planting and actual habitat restoration. So tree planting is most often done with an exotic species such as pine trees or eucalyptus trees or some sort of fast growing uh, species which are cut at the end of a cycle. So whatever habitat uh, was being provided there for species, it no longer exists after this, those trees are cut. And most importantly as well, when you plant a species like that, that is not native to the, to the area, it doesn't provide food or shelter to the vast majority of animals. So it doesn't actually tackle the biodiversity crisis in any way, it, it only makes it worse. So it's, it's very important to separate difference between tree planting. And sometimes people use Reforestation is, is a very ambiguous um, name. Sometimes reforestation only means really tree planting. But what can be done is actually forest restoration, um, which again is done by planting trees in many cases. But if you do it properly, um, you can have really um, great benefits for biodiversity and benefits for for. Um, for carbon sequestration as well. So, and if you want to, to know about um, a way of, of doing this properly, I suggest that you look into the Atlantic forests of Brazil, which of all places, um, uh, it's um, which is a, a less known tropical forest in, in, in along the coast of, of Brazil, but it's also very rich, uh, species rich, and, and it's highly threatened. And um, and the federal government and state governments of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro have passed laws uh, based on results that Morena Mills and I have done in the past, promoting the reforestation of the restoration of the Atlantic forest. And the government is also part of this, uh, of a, what is called the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact, which is a multi-institution initiative that is behind restoration of what already is up to 1.5 million hectares of forest. So, you know, quite quite a lot. So there, there is political will, at least at some levels, and, and there is a lot of scientific knowledge and the right incentive from, from the private sector. And just to show that um, when we mean habitat restoration, we don't mean just kind of, you know, let's stop everything else at, at the cost of, of human um, productivity or, or economics. So for instance, in, in this photo, you can see in the bottom, um, it's a, a, an area that, um, that was pretty bare. And then they, they've uh, restored this area in a way that they've created some eucalyptus trips and forests in the middle. So that allows um, the land Owner to to obtain some some benefits from that land while also improving biodiversity. So just to wrap up, um, so we need to be extremely concerned about the biodiversity crisis uh, because it affects us directly and it will lead uh, likely to food shortages in the future. But the good news is that there is a lot that can be done and stopping deforestation is the first and most important, but through habitat restoration, we can not only mitigate some of these effects of habitat loss, but we can sequester carbon and increase the landscape connectivity for species to move um, as the climate changes. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I'll not ask you any questions. I'll just move to, to, to Dr. Richard Gill. And he's going to be talking us, to us about how climate change will influence the impacts of other stresses on biodiversity. OK, thanks a lot, Morena. Just sharing the screen. Hopefully that has come up. Uh, just to check, you can see the screen? Yep, it's perfect. That's great. Uh, well, thanks for the invite to, to, to give this talk. Um, and um, some great talks uh, just, just been before me. Uh, apologies, I might not have quite as pretty pictures as what uh, Chris provided, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. So my group here at Imperial College is, is very interested in, in understanding how certain environmental uh, factors that are part of environmental change are placing insect populations and in general insect biodiversity under threat and we're really trying to get down to, to the mechanisms of those. Um, I'm particularly interested in how agricultural land use change is affecting insects 
Um, and as part of that, I've been doing a lot of work on how pesticides are having an effect. But my interests are moving quite heavily now towards the effect of climate change and even interacting with, with pesticides. So I'll touch on that uh, a little bit in this talk. But I think the key thing I need to, to, to start with is that globally, insects are incredibly important. I, I really don't think it's an exaggeration that if you know insect biodiversity or insects in general were to vanish, generally speaking, the world would, would be, you know, Earth would be an absolute lost cause because they are so incredibly important. Um, for example, these termites, you know, they turn over an incredible amount of, of, of soil and that's very, very important in making sure that nutrients are recycled within the soil and that's important for all sorts of things such as tree growth. Insects are incredibly important predators and scavengers, for example, this wasp here, everyone thinks that wasps are often pests, but they're very, very important in keeping down herbivores that might be pests for our crops, for example, or other native trees. Insects like this ant are very, very important seed dispersers, uh, and they'll often take seeds today even down into their colonies, which of course increases the chances that that seed will then germinate and produce new trees. This parasitoid wasp, for example, keeps down pest um, uh, aphids uh, by actually injecting an egg into them and, and killing that aphid. So natural enemies, insects are, are very important for that. These dung beetles are very, very important for recycling dung and, and putting nutrients back into the soil. And as sort of echoes um, are, are one of the slides that, that Chris highlighted, insect pollinators are also very, very important in making sure not only that there's the health of wildflowers and the reproduction of wildflowers, but also the yield of, uh, you know, most of the world le the leading crops across the globe. And just to echo the amount that's worth, I, I thought I'd put all the zeros in there really to hit this message home, that every single year across the globe, in, uh, animal pollinators um, provide an economic value of over 150 billion euros every single year by increasing yields of, of crop plants. And that's just focusing on pollinators. In fact, if we brought all of those ecosystem services together that insects provide, well, I reckon it'd be estimated in the trillions, if not, if not higher. And I think really, as I said before, if we were to lose all insects, the world would be a bit of a lost cause. So in my opinion, even it's great to put an economic value on, but losing them is, you know, the, the services they provide is just priceless and we can't afford to lose them. So hence, insect losses are of grave concern and they should be at the top of some of the agendas that are being talked about. I mean, for example, in Germany, in a uh, where they um, set up uh, traps to look at um, aerial insects, they set these up across a number of na um, nature reserves. And from about 1989, right through to 2016, they saw a huge increase in the a decrease, sorry, in the numbers of aerial insects that they were catching in regards to biomass. I think the important thing to highlight here is across, this is the, the time across the x-axis, but if you have a look at this y-axis, this is actually on a log scale. What that means is whilst this looks like a, a subtle decrease on this graph, it's actually an exponential decrease in biomass because this is on a log axis. And in fact, over just kind of 20 years or so, we've lost potentially nearly 75% of our insect biomass which is quite disturbing news. And this is also backed up with other work that's been done, for example, here in the UK, um, where along the x-axis here, we have time from 1980 to 2012 or 13. And here um, there was a group in CEH that did some occupancy modeling. Essentially, they looked at every kilometer squared of the UK and looked to see whether they saw species occurring in those squares over time. And in all cases, you can see here for this top line is um, the surfids, the hoverflies, and the blue line is uh, bees. And in both cases, they found declines, essentially saying that you're less likely to find these certain species in areas of the UK over the past 30 years. And of course, losing insect biodiversity, losing species or potentially losing genetic variation or the traits that they, they provide does have significant ramifications. And there are huge numbers of these, but I thought I would just focus on, on two. One being how this impacts on the function that this insect um, community provides, and also understanding how losing diversity provides lower resilience to future perturbations. 
for example, this is actually quite an old paper and we've known this for a long time and yet still I don't think it's being accepted as much as it should be. There was a very nice paper looking at um, coffee plant, um, highland coffee plantations and this group looked at um, how many bees visited uh, flowers and whether that provided an increased percentage in fruit set within coffee. What was interesting is they found relatively little relationship in the numbers of insects. So that's the actual abundance of individuals coming to the flowers. It didn't really increase fruit set. But what was important is when they then actually put that into diversity, or in this case, alpha diversity of species, when you looked at fruit set, there was a very clear positive relationship. So what this is highlighting is that having diversity can actually improve ecosystem function in this regard to fruit yield. It's not just about the number of visits. We can't just necessarily place more and more honeybee hives, for example, in these crops. We do need the native and wild diversity to make sure we get that increase. And one possible reason for that is that by having diversity, we have insurance. Essentially, we have increased resilience to future, future perturbation. So for example, if you considered this type of plant pollinator network where you have a couple of bee species and a couple of flowers, it's great if we can have both bee species visiting both flowers because it gives us a level of insurance. What I mean by this is that if we have a future perturbation, for example, an emergent disease, which of course is on our radar at the moment with things like COVID, um, if we have a future disease on and it kills off one of these species, it's okay if we lose that species to some extent because we have this insurance of this other um, bee species still pollinating these flowers and hopefully then at least we are maintaining that ecosystem function and the diversity of flowers in that area. Obviously we don't want to lose species but having diversity just provides us with that resilience. The issue is if we've already got a depauperate um, community or we're losing them at such a high rate then if that disease, and we don't have this, these other species, if this disease comes in and takes out the species, this then disconnects this interaction, of course, and these plants have no pollinators to rely on, and then we potentially lose an even larger number of flower species that these pollinators, that these um, plants were reliant on. So having diversity also buffers ourselves against future pressures, for example, things like climate change. And yet there's evidence that with the worrying signs of climate change is shaping our insect communities in some ways, potentially in a negative way. This was a very nice paper that came out recently in science. And essentially, they also um, did some occupancy modeling. They essentially went to different areas in North America and Europe and looked to see whether um, species that they'd seen there 30 or 40 years ago were still there today. They then modeled that and in nearly every case, as you can see, based on this um, vertical dashed line, nearly all the species had seen a reduced probability of being at those sites compared to 30 or 40 years before. North America saw a particularly negative effect. Europe, a bit less negative, but you can see the majority of species are less likely to be found at X number of sites 30, 40 years in, in contemporary populations compared to 34 years before. And in fact, when you put that together, the likelihood of any bumblebee population surviving in every given place in just 30 years had declined by nearly a third. And this is, they think, because um, in, the, in the lower southern parts of their range, they found that bees were unable to um, cope with um, high um, uh, increases in temperature. And actually, uh, bees at their southern limits were having to move northward in latitude. But what other uh, worrying or concern that we might be having, and this is where some of my work starts to come into, into effect, is not only how climate change independently is having effect on these bees, but how might climate change actually interact and modulate other drivers? For example, my work has been doing a lot of um, research on the effect that pesticides have on insect pollinators, particularly bumblebees. And so we set out to look at how the toxicity of chemicals when, when bees are exposed to them 
might be different under differing temperatures. For example, as the environment temperature increases, does that decrease or increase the toxicity of these pesticides? So we've been doing a little bit of work having a look at the flightability of bumblebees, as you can see in this video based on the flight mill. The cool thing about this is we can determine how fast they're flying, but in particular, how far they can fly. And that foraging ability is very, very important, of course, not only for bees to, to be successful, but also to provide the pollination service that they give to us, particularly for our crops. And what we found is when we put them under a kind of a relative low, and mid temperature, generally speaking, when we, the, the pesticide exposed bees, which are the purple and green, didn't really fly that much. Um, they, they flew a very similar distance as the control bees. And that was actually the same as when we looked at the mid temperature. But the worrying thing was when we actually put them under a high temperature, so this was actually 30 degrees Celsius, suddenly the effect of the pesticide had a much greater impact. And in fact, a pesticide, a neonicotinoid pesticide that we exposed the bees to, were flying half the distance than the control pesticides. We did not see this effect at the low and mid temperatures, but we did see it when we put them under a high temperature. So there is concern there, not only that climate change can be having direct effects, but they can also be having these indirect effects by modulating and interacting with other stresses. So what do we want? people to take on board from this and, and how can we, we advise um, you know, people on the UN, UN Climate Change Conference? Firstly, we cannot look overlook the value of insects. They are absolutely vital to the Earth's ecosystems and as much money and as much attention should be put on those as necessarily in ver uh, vertebrates, I think. The current losses will have, are having very high and significant economic and ecological impacts but of course, it's going to be very important for our health and welfare as well. In fact, most of the nutrients that we rely on are come from crops that are reliant on insect pollinators, as well as protect potentially a lot of medicinal plants. High rates of environmental change, over, particularly over this last century, are placing an unprecedented pressure on insect communities, particularly things like climate change. But so much, it's so fast, the rate is changing so quickly the issue is that there's just not enough evolutionary time frame for these insects to show necessary adaptations. So we've got this issue of whether the insects either have to adapt, potentially move in distribution, or they simply die and go extinct because they can't adapt quick enough. And that's why I think we must act now. Unless we act now, climate change will exacerbate the impacts from other risk factors, as I've just shown you, such as things like pesticide toxicity, and I think to echo what uh, Bruno and, and, um, and Chris has said, there are some positive messages coming on. There are, is being action, but we need to act faster than we are now. And I'll finish there. Thank you, Rich, that was great. Back my video. So it says I'm not ma managing to start my video because of the host has disabled it. So if somebody, there you go, there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, so if I can get all the panel members, um, I've got some really great questions that have come through um, already. Um, I, I'll remind all the, the audience, if you want to ask questions, please type them up in the Q&A section of, of Zoom and, and, and I'll try to, ask as many as I can. We've only got 10 minutes, so we don't have that much time, but um, I'll, I'll jump on to asking some of the questions already. So the first question um, is, is for Helen, and it's about, a, I guess, understanding how um, we can model the evolution of biodiversity over millions of years and actually predict the response of biodiversity to current environmental challenges, especially considering how quickly these current environmental challenges are happening. Um, and there was a question about the data that was being used as well. 
Okay, so um, uh, sorry if my talk gave the impression that we can directly predict um, what's going to happen in the future with, uh, with um, uh, models that we uh, fit in the past. Um, I think the idea is more to give us some insights of how biodiversity responded in the past and not to have quantitative models. Um, uh, but um, I can give one concrete example for how this can be useful. For example, if we think about uh, the problem of measuring how fast species can adapt. So this is something that's uh, really time consuming and problematic to do um empirically, uh, but what we can do with the types of model that we develop is to estimate um, uh, rates of evolution, uh, rates of niche evolution in the past, and this um, gives us an idea of how fast species can adapt. And so we know that when faced to, with um, uh, global changes, uh, species can have a move, adapt, or go extinct, right? So having um, a, a rate at which they can adapt is something that's super um, uh, important, and um, uh, having estimate estimates of how uh, of um, how niche, uh, how fast the species were able to adapt in the past is really um, helpful, for example, in this context. Cool. Wonderful. Thanks, Helen. It's fascinating work. Um, the next question for Rich. Um, Rich, so, so you talked about how um, climate change shapes insect communities, but are there other ways um, other than just species loss that, um, that, were, that climate change is also influencing? I think it's a great question. Um, yes, I mean, we, we often think, people often think about biodiversity loss as being some sort of um, alpha, what we call alpha diversity change, where it's simply, do we gain or lose a species compared to what's left in the community? But of course, biodiversity means so much more, whether it be genetic diversity that we're left with and whether it be functional diversity. So all the different traits, all those morphological traits and pollinators, it might be their size, their tongue length, their wing size. Are we, are we gaining or losing that under climate change? And I would argue that we, we don't really know. Um, there's been more work done in things like birds and vertebrates, but in insects less so. Um, I'm sure Chris might be able to say something about that as well as Helen. Um, but some work we are doing, for example, is we, we had some recent funding to look at museum specimens. So we're looking at how functional traits have, have changed over the past century. And we're also doing work up in, in Lapland, right? You know, it's really the, the forefront of where, um, of where climate change is ca happening. Um, and we're, having to, we're looking at how climate change is affecting the functional composition of those communities up there. So yeah, good question. And uh, still more needs to be done when looking at a, a function. Oh, great. Thanks, Rich. Um, so the, ne the next question is for Bruno. Um, so Bruno, I was I was just wondering if, uh, or what some the audience actually was wondering what um, what you could tell us that France has been doing specifically to ta tackle biodiversity issues. I think I, maybe with some of the more significant um, policy decisions, and then I'll jump to Chris and 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 Rich to let me know what they think about the UK as well after that. It's a huge question. <laughs> so we and I, and I am not a politician. Um, we, we just recently in France uh, had the law on biodiversity. Uh, this was a discussion in the parliament and uh, this was discussed and it was voted. Uh, of course, it's probably not enough, but at least we have this law. Uh, on the other side, we have many tools regarding uh, biodiversity to observe biodiversity. And for example, the museum is in charge of uh, national inventories. We are in charge of uh, the inventory of French biodiversity, and we have so far uh, more than 80 million occurrences of different species. It's about uh, 200,000 species which are recorded over more than 80 million occurrences over the, the country. So it's, it's really important. And we are also doing a lot regarding expertise. That is to say, that is to say um, supporting uh, political decision by scientific uh, advertisement, by scientific uh, analysis. So this is, every time it's separate things. We have not, except the law, maybe a big thing. And of course, it's full of contradiction. Uh, recently, for example, it was a law again against the law of Europe to, uh, to kill birds, to, uh, to hunt, to have a specific bird hunting in uh, southwest France. 
And uh, it's, it's really a problem, but that bothers me a lot about that. Of course, I cannot really tell that because I am in charge of uh, uh, the museum, but it's very really bothering because on one side we are telling something, on the other side we are doing some other things. Of course, it's normal to have some contradiction. We have. Uh, we are in progress. We can do more. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump to Chris. Um, Chris, do you know what's, um, what the UK government is doing in terms of biodiversity? I know they've, they've launched the big, um, they're, they're planning to plant lots of trees. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I'll try to be. Um, I'll try to be nice here. So I. I don't think I, I fully agree with all the the plans that are being made. Um, I think the, the 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 UK government is very much focusing a lot on on tree planting, which, as I said in you know in my talk, is is a, a very big problem for biodiversity. It's not really going to benefit biodiversity very much. And also, um, the UK has. Um, is planning to increase, for instance, the amount of natural area, uh, sorry, protected areas, but those protected areas are not protected in the same way as many other places in the world. So um, if you go to a, a, a national park here in the UK, you're going to see a lot of industry, you're going to see a lot of um, species, uh, exotic species, uh, you know, grazing, which is not the same as you would see, for instance, in a national park in Africa or in a national park in, in South America. So this is to say that um, I think there's what's being done is not enough and, um, and it, a lot more needs to, to be done and much more aggressively than what it's currently being planned. Cool. Well, that, that'll lead me straight to my next question. And, and it's basically a question for all the panelists and you've only got a few words, a few seconds of each because we're going to be running out of time. But what's the most important message you have for the government officials attending COP26? Um, and yeah, so maybe you'll start with, with Bruno. Do something. Realize that life is, uh, is some, something complex. Uh, we have to deal with complexity. It's, it's so. And so we have to deal with, but we are not without possibilities to do things. So just decide to do the things and life will follow up. That's, that's a great. Helen? Um, okay, maybe I would say that uh, we are behind in terms of uh, predicting in like a good quantitative modeling way, um, uh, being able to give quantitative predictions for biodiversity and um, there's part of it that needs to be done through fundamental research. I think that's what I would say. So not forget it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Chris? Um, life finds a way to come back. So I think if we heavily invest in that, that will solve many of the issues we're seeing. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, and Richard? We're past the point of making profit from losing diversity. We will gain more from, from conserving it. That's, that's my opinion. Um, if we are going to be resilient to future stresses, we have to make sure that we maintain diversity. And one way of doing that, obviously, is to make sure that we're, we're, we're going towards net zero. Right, wonderful. I think um, politicians would be very wise to listen to all this all this advice. Um, thank you so much um, to all the presenters. The presentations were wonderful. And thank you so much to the audience for joining us and for all your questions. Um, I really enjoyed this. I hope you did too. Um, so, so, so thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.